Hello and welcome to Sonova's True Crime Files on YouTube. Uh, today we are talking to ex-mob associate Sidney James Hurd, who was the subject of my first true crime book, Unorganized Crime. What people don't realize is he was actually the Amarillo arsonist for over 20 years. He was never caught, but he was that was used as a bargaining chip later in one of his uh, agreements that he, when he uh, turned state's witness. So today we're talking to him about some of those fires some of them, you know, were lighting the match, others were pretty intense. So today we're going to talk about the ones that he is able to talk about today. Welcome, Sydney. Hello, how are you? Hi. Before I, uh, we get into it, uh, some of the arson, I'd like to explain maybe to your viewers actually what started me into the arson business. You want to hear about that, how I got into it? Okay. Of course. When I was in the federal prison, you know, I've been in the state prison, it's in my book, and I'm in the federal prison. I am the clerk as an inmate clerk, of course, for the psychiatrists and psychologists. So my idea is this, I'm bank robber to a lot of bank robbers. Why in the world, what is the crime that nobody goes to prison for? So I get them, I con them into, let's see what people are in prison for. So I write every prison in the United States, you know, the state prison system, and find out what people are in prison for. Well, we get letters back. They were excited to talk to a psychiatrist and psychologist in a federal prison, you know, and so I knew they would be. And here we get all these letters back and I'm looking and I see the word arson. I thought, what the world's arson? I see no conviction. No, none, none, one, two. So then I don't tell them, but I sent a letter. The ones that we'd like to have the records on the ones that were convicted. And I found out every one of them that were convicted had told on themselves. And then I started studying the laws, the federal laws on arson. Every state's different. Arson is a crime that you could walk into a building, walk out of a building, it blow up, and they can't prove that you did that arson. How can they prove it? Unless you tell on yourself or there's an eyewitness or a camera. Nowadays, of course, there's camera. So then I said, well, that sounds pretty good, but how do you make money on it? So then I started studying the insurance laws. And you people would say, well, is that all you got to do? Yes, I'm in prison. What else have I got to do but to try to learn how to be a better crook? That's what my philosophy was. So then I realized that insurance company, as long as you keep it under $100,000, they will pay off instantly, normally right away within 30 days because they don't want to be sued because a lot of states have laws that if you sue as a church company, you get triple damages. So then I learned on that. Then I tried to learn that what chemical inside a building is automatically found without a trace. And believe it or not, it's paint thinner because paint thinner has turpentine in it. And every piece of wood built, no matter what, has turpentine in it. It's just, you know, when a tree is grown, there's turpentine. That's where they get out of wood. Also, lighter fluid is untraceable because of the chemicals that when you light it up. So I realized a mixture of turpentine and lighter fluid would be a good thing out to start. Now, when I get out of prison, I don't think about that much about it yet, you know, I'm in Amarillo. And I run into an insurance man who later we, was convicted, Earl Sampson. And he asked me one time, he said, I had this friend of mine that had this fire, but we need the paperwork filled out. So I... I he says this much for this money, this much for this. Next thing we know is he's up to fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars, and he said, "Well, write that in at your construction company. We'll do it for all that." So I do, and then he said, "Here's a couple hundred dollars, and we're going to get a check made out to you, and you just sign it over, and I'll take care of it." Because he, at that time, as an insurance agent, could write a check up to twenty thousand dollars. So this was a friend of his that had a fire that really there wasn't maybe a thousand dollars worth of damages done. So I realized right then and there, okay. So I had three rent houses and they were all together. Uh, one on the corner was a three bedroom. One in the middle was an old lady that lived there that uh, she please don't go up on my $50 a month rent. And I told her there's no way I would. She sat out in a chair all the time and house was full of cockroaches and everything. But she was just, you know, an old lady. I knew it wasn't gonna live much longer. Had big old legs swelled up with the same thing I've got right now on my leg. So, but the lady next door was fixing to move out. Well, I had that thing insured. I had each one of them insured, but I had that one insured for $10,000. So I thought, well, so I realized that she was using electric heaters all the time. 
you know, and even though she could turn the gas on because she had to pay for the gas. So she would use that electric heater. So I put the electric heater inside after she moved out. She had a bunch of papers and trash in there. So one, two o'clock in the morning, I went over there, snuck over a block away, walked over and went in there, turned the electric heater on. And even though there was nobody in there, it, by the closet where she had, and I sprayed the closet with a bunch of uh, lighter fluid and then lit the lighter fluid because that's slow burning. It's not an instant burn. You never use gasoline because it'll kill you. So, and diesel fluid is good. But anyway, I set it on fire and walked out and later collected $10,000, not only for the insurance, but I collected another two, 3,000 to the house next door, got damages from the fire and everything. So that was actually the first fire I had that I actually did where I collect insurance on. I took a lot of that money and bought another rent houses and started using the money that I made on that to rent houses. Then I ran into a guy who was in the Supreme Court case that he you know, took was J.C. Lane. Now, J.C., I went to work for him as a, for $200 a week and helped run a lot of his apartments that he owned and different buildings he owned, and he wanted to come back. He wanted to go into construction business and build houses and everything. So, and the little office he gave me was an office that used to be a jeweler store where a guy came in and killed the jeweler and robbed him and everything and got a sentence to death. So, you know, the little office was kind of spooky in a way right on this one street there that known a guy was murdered in the back there. And so he wanted a building next door. He talked about, you know, I wish he could build this other building. So I said, well, I got a guy out of Chicago that might do it for like a $500, you know, come through. And, and I don't know why I said so cheap at that time, but I set it up for like $500. Well, it was not supposed to be, it was a fourplex. Nobody was supposed to be in the apartment, but I ended up, believe it or not, there was a guy on the top floor that when the fire started, which I set it in a closet because uh, I had keys to all there. I would never ever always set fires in houses, buildings, restaurants and all that, only if there was nobody in them because I didn't want to take the chance. I turned down more arsons when people living in apartment complexes, forget it. If they were vacant, different story. So I went in there and set the fire. And uh, of course, JC thinks it was somebody out of Chicago and I get to $500, but it burns it. It does enough smoke damages. It gets about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 insurance, gets a new roof on this thing next door. So he makes out like a bandit on the deal. Well, then I had a friend of mine that wanted me to open, take over a bar called Tiny's Pool Hall on 6th Street. And I was guaranteed more money there because, you know, you can hustle a lot in, the, in, you know, having a bar. So I took over the bar at the same time I ran into this guy that was selling molding. And what was called molding, it was like inside corners, outside corner, base and casing. I could buy this rejected molding for sometimes $4,000 for 300,000 square feet, what was worth about 30 grand. So I thought, well, let me see here. So I had this friend of mine named Rodney Horn. And I said, Rodney, listen, here's the deal. I can get you this truckload of molding for 6,000. That way I make a couple thousand. I can set up a guy that will burn the building for $2,000. We'll put it in a warehouse, you're a contractor, the building will burn. You'll have a receipt that you paid $29,500 for the molding and insurance company will pay off. You want to do the deal? And he said, yeah. So he rented this. What was unbelievable, he rented this place that had security 24 hours a day in the buildings that you had to go through a TV camera. But on the back of the building, of the storage buildings, I had a little warehouse in there full of a bunch of antique stuff and everything. So I could get in from the streets. I didn't have to I pay real less rent because they weren't that secure. So we got the truckload of lumber and a tr molding. We put the molding in there and I uh, made sure that he was gone fishing. He loved to go to Mexico, go fishing. He was out of town. So what I did, I had a girlfriend at that time that name was Carol. She deceased as she's in the book and everything. Uh, she had a station wagon. She pulled up. I got up on the roof, went down. But before that, I went in Rodney's warehouse a day ahead of time. I drilled a hole through the ceiling and I put a little white flag up there. So you couldn't see it but from there. Underneath, I had a plastic dish, plastic. And in that plastic dish was full of uh, turpentine. 
They had lighter fluid right underneath the hole. Okay, so that's where that is. And it's sitting on these big bundles of molding. There's eight bundles of molding in there, over 300,000 worth. If, if you tried to buy the mold, it'd be worth 30, 40 grand. And uh, he only paid 6,000, which I made 2,000 on it. Then I charged 2,000 for the arson, which he thought it was somebody out of Chicago taking care of it. Today's episode is brought to you by Bones Coffee Company. You can forget about boring coffee when you drink Bones Coffee. Not only do they offer a variety of flavors such as strawberry cheesecake and maple bacon, they are a family-owned company that puts great detail not only in their coffee, but in the artwork that comes on each individual bag. Bones Coffee has a coffee club that will deliver your favorite coffee to your door every month. If that wasn't enough, they also have some amazing swag to offer. Check out Bones Coffee Company today. I'll have my affiliate links in the show notes for you. So I had her back the thing up, went up there, curled on the roof all the way. You got to realize there's security cameras out front and there's a security guard to get in and out of the warehouse, you know, the storage building. So I get up over there and I see my little flag sticking up. I take my little flag out and I got cotton balls that I hold in my hand and just put a little bit of a lighter fluid on it because that won't burn that fast. And I drop it down in there, Doop, watch it go down in the hole. As soon as it hit the hole, it hit that little plastic thing where it was, started on fire instantly. And as I was crawling back down, you could see the smoke coming out. It was unbelievable. Like here's the Indian smoke signal coming out of the hole, right? So <laughs> here comes the smoke. I said, well, I know that's on fire. So me and Carol, we take off, we go to Albuquerque. That way I'm out of town too when it happened, you know? So, <laughs> and uh, me and Rodney, uh, he got to church. And what was funny is it burned like five or six stories building the fire marshal said the fire started and the building down the next building was a guy had a bunch of bolts and motors in there and he had a bunch of gasoline and gasoline rags and that's what said caught the fire in other words there was no suspicion on rodney's deal or anything well rodney collected twenty nine thousand five hundred dollars insurance we had to go to oklahoma to get the check and we went there and stayed there up all night long because they gave him a voucher and the next day we cashed it and then a week later uh, him and me went to Mexico, down to the interior of Mexico, go fishing. So Rodney was kind of like, you know, my first big one where I made some money. So I explained to Earl, because Earl, you know, insurance, he had covered the insurance for Rodney. He knew that it was a scam. He said, well, I want to do one in Lubbock. So we ran a warehouse in Lubbock, because he, he, he was a builder too. And uh, he set uh, the molding. We bought the same deal, set the molding up and everything. And... And that fire there, uh, Carol just dropped me off. I went in there, set the fire, came back out. She picked me up. It was snow all over everywhere and everything. And there was no security on that one. And we love it. And Earl collected a 29000 something insurance. He had a bill that the same kind of bill from a guy in California. Now, the guy in California was named George Gopher. And what I would do, I'd buy the truckload of molding, believe it or not, for like, and what he did. The molding was made through diamond match company that actually make diamond matches. And it was inside corners, outside corners, case, basic, you know, whatever they could use. But it had a reject and it had a flaw. So they would have to destroy it, but he would just go pick it up and haul it off for nothing. Take it to his ranch and his wife and kids would stack it all up, tie it all up. And, and then he would take it all around the country and sell it. And they usually get anywhere from four to $5,000 a truckload. When I realized after I started making money with this, I opened up a warehouse in Amarillo and Southern Lumber Company, I sold them $90,000 worth of molding at 10 cents a foot. And I was only paying like, you know, nothing, $4,000 for 300,000 square feet. So I was making a lot of good money on that. And then the word got around in Amarillo that, uh, you know, a lot of businesses, you know, were hurting, they could, easily set up a scam and there's a guy out of Chicago they didn't mention my name of course that could set it up then JC at that time came to me that he had a restaurant right across there that he was in partners with a guy called El Toros and he wanted to get out of the partnership because a guy in it but they had business interrupted insurance which means if something happens on they still can get their you know insurance money so 
I got the keys to the place and I, I, I think I charged him a thousand dollars for that the guy from Chicago was going to do it again. Everybody thought all the arsons that I did were people from Chicago because here's the reason I set that up like that. I was just the middleman. If somebody did snitch, the only thing they could say, I gave Sydney the money. They could never say, I gave the guy who set the fires the money. So when on that one, what I did, I did the electrical thing. Uh, there was an old building, so I put the, all the lighter fluid and everything in the electrical thing, set it on fire. Well, that way the fire would go up through the plastic in there. And what it did was didn't burn the building, but it did the smoke damages mm -hmm. that were they collected three months of nothing but business interrupted insurance. They made a killing on that because mm -hmm. they could pad the how much money they were taking in the restaurant. And then JC got out of the contract with the guy. So is that the, worked out real good. That you, uh, is that the one that you went and soaked down the coffee pots? Do what? You went in and soaked down the coffee pots with lighter fluid? No, no, that's a different one. No, that's doctor, the doctor's yep. one. And what he did, uh, the doctor and me played bridge a lot. And, you know, he knew who I was and he of me and all that. And he came to me one night after bridge and said, let's go have a drink. I need to talk to you. Up. He said, out there by the medical center, I'm in partners with this guy who's ripping me off. I said, how's he ripping you off? He said, we got this restaurant together. And I've invested the money, but he's supposed to be paying me and he's not, he's screwing me. But I've got a bunch of insurances all in my name. I need to get out of that lease and get it. So I said, it's right across in the medical center and it opened 24 hours a day. He said, no, it's closed in the evening. So I said, well, this is probably going to cost you at least, you know, because he's a doctor. I know he could afford to pay at least three, four thousand dollars. I said, because the guy's got to come, you know, I started going up on the price when I realized it was too cheap. So this is in between some other arsons, but I, I go out there and I look at the restaurant, but I notice they got a coffee pot with six coffee machines sitting on it. Mm -hmm. And I know that that is unbelievable because if it shortens out, it's going to burn the countertop. Mm -hmm. So I know that I can also use the El Toro. I said, do you have business interrupted insurance? He said, yeah. I said, good. Why? I said, just, where? I said, there's no way I can burn that whole building, but I can make enough smoke and damage it. We'll have to close up. You and the guy can get out of the lease and you'll be safe and you get some money in that. And you'll have them nailed right then and there with the insurance checks coming in. He said, okay. I said, okay, uh, this is going to cost you, though, know, 4000 2000 up front, 2000 after the deal. He said, okay, no problem. So one night playing bridge, as we went out there, he handed me an envelope, 2000 in it, and I with the keys to the building because it didn't have no alarms or nothing. So, you know, this is one that, I got to tell people, the viewers, because at that time in Amarillo, I didn't even know it. Uh, I was under a federal task force for a bunch. This is arson close to the Cougar Ram thing. What happened was that I had a police officer there that I knew re really well. He stumbled in that. He'd have a fistful of money that were all dollar bills, and he was supposed to be the narcotic officer in Amarillo, and he couldn't be buy narcotics from everybody because everybody knew that's what he was. So what they would do a lot of time, and that's another idiot thing they did, they'd bring a, an undercover agent, a police officer up from Lubbock, but him and the Lubbock guy would go out to drink together in the bars. So everybody knew that Gary bringing a guy in, he's gotta be a cop. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna do something cool with this one. So I go in there and I'm sitting at the bar with Gary, you know, at a table, and this is the caravan, which is, I owned a piece of, and the undercover agent. So. We're all talking, the undercover agent, knowing that I'm on federal task force for all kinds of stuff, arsons and all that. So I had this girl that I, Dick and Dick's not there that night, so I have a key to the office. I tell this girl, here's what you're going to do. When you're on break, you're going to come to my table. You're going to say, let's go to the office. I say, okay, we're going to go to the office. We're going to lock the door and don't you ever, ever, ever open that door up. And I'm going out the side door. So I could go out the side door. I'd get out the side door for five minutes, hop in my car, go up there, open up, and I sprayed all over lighter fluid about it on the coffee pots, set all the coffee pots on and lit them and left, right? I go back. Now we're talking only two, three minutes in the building. We're talking five minutes to get there, five minutes to get back. We go back in the office and I hand her about, oh, two, at that time, cocaine was $100 a gram. I hand her about $200 worth of cocaine. Do you need anything else? No, except for one thing, what? I want to go have breakfast with you 
that was the thing about going to my house for breakfast, which she knew what that meant. I knew what that meant. So we went back out and it's her 15 minute break and I go right back to the tables. And later I found out that they testified that there's no way he could have set that on fire. Hell, he was here drinking with us and wasn't, a, you know, so that was like, you know, I wanted a good alibi at that one. So that one there was a pretty good alibi. One of the things that me and Rodney did after Rodney got his first one, he wanted to set up another one. But I said, we don't want to set up another one in, you know, Amarillo. So one day we drove over to uh, Potales, New Mexico. And while we're at Potales there, we're looking around and we found a nice warehouse. And this time Rodney wants to buy two loads of clothes, two loads of lumber. In other words, and that way he can insure the thing for fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Right. So the reason why I bring this one up is kind of ironic. So we get the warehouse and we get the lumber all delivered and everything. So we're driving back over there and he said, who are we going to insure the, it with? And as we're driving in to the town, I see this big board and on the board is a deer and it says, burn insurance company. I know that sounds, I said, I got the just and right insurance company. Well, I said, right there, Burn Insurance Company. It's telling us to use it, Burn Insurance Company. <laughs> so we insured it with Burns Insurance Company, and he had to insure part of it with Lords of London, believe it or not, because <laughs> he couldn't cover it. So, And then when we burnt that, a lot of the stuff just got singed. So we took the actual, about eight lifts of that, half of the lumber load, we put black tarp over it and took it to actually a warehouse where he kept his forklift tractors and all that because he was in the concrete business. And we put them all up for safekeeping for elsewhere because, you know, they've already been burned once and so we can go burn them again somewhere else that would. <laughs> and so what's really ironic, later I sold that same lumber. I said, what'd you pay? You paid 6000 for the lumber. Yeah, I got that whole lumber sold for you for $6,000. He said, you serious? Yeah, you just got to deliver it to Lubbock. He said, you're going to give me 6000 And I said, yeah. And I sold the lumber for $8,000 to a guy that I was setting a fire with in Lubbock. And that way he already had eight lifts that were already burned. We didn't have to worry that it would melt the plastic on it, right? So yeah. that was ironic in a way that uh, with that on uh, that one. But uh, then I, I wanted to make sure people knew that I was using people out of Chicago. So I had this guy working for me. And he wasn't as smart as I thought in McFarland. And I, me and Suzanne went to the Bahamas. Well, at the same time, JC, JC Lane and a guys that owned a whole block were trying to buy everything in the block. Then they were gonna tear it all down and build a, a big apartment complex. So he was kind of remodeling a duplex and we had it stored with lumber and all that kind of stuff and carpet and everything. And I had McFarland set it on fire while I was in the Bahamas. Well, he set it on fire, but he did a false job. And people saw him running through the alley. The only thing it took the heat off that it was actually me setting the fires because he set that fire. And and JC paid, that's the one we went to trial on, you know. But the whole thing was there were two other rich men in town there. I don't want to mention their names, they're probably all dead anyway. But at the end of that apartment complex was a 24 unit apartment building. And they wanted, the guy wanted to get out of it. But when they talked to me, I said, no way. you got to empty the damn building. I'm not going to set a fire on there. Well, you can go through the basement. They sh showed where they could set the fire. Go up through there. Everybody will get out in time. I said, no, no, I don't do that. My friends out of Chicago, we don't never risk setting something on fire. And the reason why I'm telling you this, because this is a true story. I am already sentenced in the federal prison. I'm already working out in the county jail at the gun range, right? The building burnt that night, you know, about this is two, three months later. When the building burnt, a fireman was checking the units and opened up and killed the fireman. And when I found out it killed that fireman, oh my God, I was right away in touch with Shirley LaBelle. She got in touch with the AT&T. And they actually, you know, I went out there and showed them where the fire started. They couldn't believe I knew where the fire was. I said, well, that's where they wanted to set it. And I told them there's no way I would do it. Well, they tried to get investigated and all the feds did, but they ran into political people, Danny Hill and them, all these people were all friends, you know, in Amarillo, politicians and all that. 
the people that actually wanted to tear all that down were real very wealthy people and very influential. <laughs> they never got the feds couldn't they couldn't prove who set it on fire. They could prove it was arson, but and then the firemen, you know, but to me it was murder. I mean, you know, it's second degree murder. But they never could get they never got no case against it or anything. But I actually took them to the actual spot or in the basement where they set the damn fire. But we we wouldn't do that. Right. Another, now, there was well, one fire that was pretty interesting. Um, you you uh, shot some barrels from a long distance away. Can you tell oh, them yeah, about that, that one? That, okay. Now, here's another thing, too, as we'll mention now, because all the stuff. I had a no, J.C. Lane fires. You know, we had one, two, three, four fires. We had three fires. He had a brother. And his brother wasn't like as rich as JC, you know, and they, they made, you know, kind of like he was a dodo and all that, but he wasn't, he was a real nice guy. He was funny, fat, and, you know, he wasn't in, his crowd wasn't the rich, wealthy people of Amarillo. It was just a normal person, contractor. So we say he had a barn out in the country on 40 acres. He put a tractor in there and I got that set for him for a couple thousand dollars. You could see that thing for 20 miles away when it would burn that night. Me and Carol set that on fire. But he had an apartment complex that he burnt down that he bought. But I showed him how to do something completely different. And this is what, what I call reverse. What he does, he buys the warehouse. He owns the two buildings next to it. He owns the sign on top that he rents out. So he's got all this. But I told him, go borrow $70,000. You've only got... 30 some odd grand into it, but borrow at the bank 70 grand. He said, well, I said, this makes the bank the mortgagee. You'll already have your profit made before the building even burns, right? So he said, I didn't think of it that way. I said, well, this is a new one, we'll try it. So he goes and I load about maybe three, $4,000 worth of junk all in the warehouse that it's insured for like $30,000, you know but I charged him for that, made a couple thousand there, set the fire up. Now, what I did was I set on the back of the, like this big front of a warehouse, right on the street, right over a bridge. So you get underneath the bridge late at night, two blocks away is the fire department. So, you know, everybody think, well, no way you can ever set this on fire, right? Okay, so what I do on a Friday, I got a key, I go in and on the back, I turn on a small valve for natural gas. The gas, I know nobody's going to be around. It goes up to the ceiling. The ceiling has got a false ceiling lowered from the high ceiling down. So for all day Friday until Sunday, there's small, not a big blast going, just a small leak of natural gas, and it's all going up and being contained in the ceiling. So now I got a Springfield, old Springfield 30-06 rifle that I bought, old military rifle. And I had tracer bullets in it. And I tried them out in the country. Sure enough, you can watch them go. Choo, choo. Now, I know why they were called tracers. You know, I never had one. But I know it's phosphorus at the end. So what we do is I do, uh, it was one night about three, four o'clock. It's a foggy night, misty out there. I go drive, park underneath the bridge, lower my rifle across, and I fire through the glass because I know it's going to go through the glass door. It ain't going to shatter it. And it's going to go, and it's going to hit that wall in the back. And that's where the gas is coming out of. Well, I fire one shot, nothing happens. And it's, hell, fire another shot, no. When I hit the third shot, that sucker went off. It was so powerful, it lifted up the whole roof, the whole ceiling and everything come caving down, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't you put some barrels of something around? Oh, yeah, I had a, a, a seven barrels full of paint thinner, you know, because, you know, that was some of the stuff he was selling and that. Right. That, that went off too, like, in other words, but the whole ceiling, when that thing was set on fire, the whole thing lifted. I looked at it and you could see it going up in the air. It was like something out of a movie. Cause it just, and then once, once the roof goes, you know, the whole, and then went down the whole walls were all blocked. Mm -hmm. So not only did he get the insurance for that, he got insurance for the big sign on top there. And then he got damages, a heat um, because of vinyl siding, plastic siding on his rent houses. So he had to recite all of them and everything. So he made out like a bandit, but he had two fires with me and he took invested his money into an apartment complex. And then he bought a motel. 
In other words, he ended up making money with his money. You know, he just didn't spend it. He wasn't the kind of guy who went out and partied or drank or any of that. But uh, he never got indicted. He never got arrested. Never had nothing to do. And I often wondered in life how people would think, you know, like he would think, wait a minute, he gave up my brother for three arsons, but he didn't say nothing about me. Well, then they got to look at it. I looked at it like this. First of all, is the evidence was going to be pretty hard to prove. Secondly, is this, because he collected the money before it even burned. That was the good part about that. I know people don't understand, but if I insure something for 70, 80,000 and I collect that money first and the bank is the mortgagee, I don't care if it's arson or not, Dave. Insurance company has to pay off to the bank. That's something that people don't know the law. In other words, it don't matter even if it's proved arson. The bank's the mortgagee, not the person. So when it looks like the bank's the mortgagee, they don't see where there was no profit made. They don't know the building only cost 30000 and had insured for 70000 You know, they don't look at it like that. They just know that the, a gas leak and it blew up the building and everything else. But the, the one that the last arson I did was with Bill Langford. Him and me uh, set up a lot of scams. He was the guy involved in the Cougar Ran, the credit card deals and all that. He had, in Breckenbridge, uh, Texas, he had bought in his flower companies, you know, he had sold flowers. <clears throat> but he used to go around every year all over Colorado and Texas and buy a, a plant called broom weed. It's used as a decoration in flowers shipped all over the world. I mean, it's the hardest thing. It only can be, it dries up. It's so pretty. It's called broom weed. You'll see it in a lot of imitation flower stuff. So they, it's really, when you sell it by box loads, you're making a lot of money, even though the box is a real life. Well, he had people he paid every year to go pick the broom weed, and he stored it in Breckenbridge until he could get it shipped. You know, he shipped to Japan, China, shipped it all over. You know, he made good money out. What happened was the whole load of broom weed that he had, they picked it too soon and it mildewed. Okay. So he's got like fifty, sixty thousand dollars in this barn worth of broom weed that he couldn't get a penny for. Oh. So he tells me, and the barn is right in downtown Breckenbridge, right on freaking square. Drive right around and here's a barn and another barn and they're old time antique barns there in Breckenbridge section. So I go look at it and got big doors where you got to go into to get into it. You know, not even a side door. I go, oh my God. <clears throat> so I go down there and I look at it and I said, told him, he don't know. I said, this is going to cost you five grand on this one. Okay. So he had the money. So he paid it up front. He wasn't worried about that. So what I did was I didn't realize I got a piece of broomery. There's oil in it. And when you set it on fire, it burns, boom. And you can't even stamp it out with your shoe. That's how bad it is. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, my God. So I go in there, and I figure, well, I got enough time to open up these doors. Three o'clock in the morning, I sneak in there. I go way to the other wall, you know, to the building, and I set the broom and just set on fire. Believe it or not, I almost did not make it out the door. That's how fast that thing went, like gasoline. I don't care if it was mildewed or not. It did. And when I shut the doors, you can see the flames coming out of the damn thing. I'm scared to live in that's closest where I almost burned up in a barn. <clears throat> now I get in there and I look in my real view mirror. And before I can get back to 287, going back to Amarillo from there, it's 22 miles. And that fire I could see in my deal with, for 22 miles, that's how hot it was and burned. Not only that, we never, I never knew, but he never told me, the guy next Next to that, he had a big barn just as big as the one downtown because it was an antique thing. He had it full of airplanes, big old vintage airplanes. Oh, I would have known that. I probably wouldn't even have done the fire. Because, yeah. you know, and I hope the guy had insurance. But, and that's the last one I did because it scared the living hell out of me. Yeah. And then, then not only that, then I'm going down the Highway 287 and my tire blow out and I think somebody shot at me. That scared the living hell. I was snorting cocaine back in them days. So, uh, I wasn't too pretty. Uh, here I am high, almost burned up, and I think somebody's shooting at me, and it's a flat tire. My yeah. tire blew in my Cadillac. Yeah. And, boy, I, and my, as soon as I got home, my wife said, 
you've been around a fire? I didn't realize my clothes even smelled uh, the broom weed. Yeah. I'm very oh protective of that. Yeah. But that was one that, that was the last one I did. You know, yeah. I just, that's it, I quit. Yeah. You know, that was, we did a bunch of them over there. Uh, another one that uh, the Weatherly brothers, uh, they owned a cabinet company. They made cabinets all over, you know, the Amarillo area. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted, and uh, I sold them a couple loads of lumber and put it in a warehouse and we burned it. There was a guy in Amarillo named Nicholson. He was a cool, he was a, one of, a black gentleman. And uh, he had dump trucks and bulldozers. And every time a fire would come, he'd be the first one to clean it up because he knew what he knew. What he, that way they get rid of the evidence right away. He'd be there with his tractors. Number, well, let me do it. I'll call the insurance company. I know who handles it. Blah, blah, blah. In other words, he got to the point where there was a fire. One week in Amarillo alone and a whole week, every day there was a fire. I got blamed for every freaking one of them. They were all warehouses and I didn't, none of them were mine. But yet it was business because I would show people. Oh, did you see where old Smith uh, Furniture Company burned up? Yeah, he collected pretty good on that insurance. What do you yeah. think? So, yeah. and, but the bad thing is, it got like, they would, people in bars would talk about it like it was a legitimate, this is what I want viewers to, like it was a legitimate business. Hey man, you know, we got this old boy, he can get your, burn your building down, collect a bunch of, they got to the point, everybody in the world, AT&T, uh, everybody was going in there trying to figure out who the arsons were. Well, then they knew that I was the connection. They didn't know who. Right. Well, let's talk about Charlie Baylor. I think that's a good one we could put in there. Okay. Charlie Baylor was at and you know, tobacco. Mm -hmm. Hated me with a passion. <laughs> I bought a house from Carol mm -hmm. for $20,000 on bottom, high neighborhood. The house was worth 70, 80,000. She said, give me 20 grand. And she owned the house free and clear. And I gave her 20 grand. I sold it that same day to Dave Merchant for 30,000. I made 10 grand. Mm -hmm. Dave sold it to the Weatherly brothers for 40,000. He made 10 grand. So mm -hmm. now there's 50, there's all this money in the same day going through. Mm -hmm. They know, they see me put in doors. I have my door manufacturer on trim. So they know, they know about the transaction. You know, I don't know that they're cool, that close watch me. They know I'm going to burn that building. They just know it's, uh, it's going to get burned. So right across the street's a two-story house. They rented the bedroom from the lady, the husband and wife and kid. They rented that bedroom for three months. Every night, Charlie sat up there with his rifle, 30, a uh, 20 something or other, 20 something rifle. And he had a bullet with the name Sid, S-I-D on the damn thing. And he was gonna shoot me when I come out of there. The fun part was, they never were going to burn the building. Well, I made 10 grand. What do I mean? David made 10 grand. Why is he interested? The Whitley brothers are going to fix it all up and sell it for 70, 80, $90,000. They ain't going to burn it. No, we were never going to burn the building. But nobody knows that. They think because of the way that. Right. Right. And years later, you met Charlie yeah. and found the, and, and, uh, and found out about the bullet with your name on it and everything. Yeah. Um, well, now tell uh, everybody, because you, you, everyone, um, I don't know if we clarified this at the beginning. You were under investigation and you had a whole task force of different things um, chasing you for quite a long time and you didn't even know about it. Right. And um, and so until the Cougaran thing came, um, you didn't even realize there was anybody after you, but you had, uh, they called up and they're like, no, we're not going to give him bail or whatever it is, um, because we're investigating him too. Um, and so, but in a long story short, you ended up turning state's witness because um, at the last minute, they finally gave you the list of all the people that had turn coded on you. Right. And well, you got yeah. mad and you're like, I don't think so. And so tell about that story. Tell everybody, you know, how did you not get prosecuted for these fires? How did you, how did you, why did you turn state's evidence? Okay, here's what happened. I got one of the best attorneys at that time, and his name was Don Irwin. He's still in law in Houston today. He was handling the Harrelson, the Judge Wood's murder case of Star Harrelson, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Harrelson, who's, right. who's, uh, father's or son is Woody Harrelson, the actor. Right. Well, his daughter is Star, or sister, I mean, was Star. 
Well, he was doing that case. And at the same time, they were the hottest attorneys in Houston. So I was using them on the Houston case and I'd already gave him 25 grand. And I, when I come to Amarillo, Don, it was in federal court, Don's going to do my case. Well, we go up there and he's there a week going through all this. And I, well, we apply for the witness list. They filed that they were not going to give us the witness list until we got ready to go to trial. Mm -hmm. And Don said suspiciously, there's mm -hmm. something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. There must be some people that they gave immunity to in front of these grand juries for a couple of years that we don't even know about. And I said, no, I don't either. So just when we're getting ready to go to trial and we're picking jurors, they whip out the witness list. There's 74 people on the witness list. Almost every one, a lot of them were bankers and it's that. 50 of them for sure I'd done illegal acts with. What it was either sell drugs to, burn buildings with, or anything. And I realized all these people are gonna snitch on me. They're gonna get up during a trial and they're gonna say, you know, he did this with me, this way. I'm not gonna get convicted on the Cougaran deal. They can't even convict me on the counterfeiting money. They already know that they're using the postal thing, you know. They can't even get this. I'm not going to get convicted. They're going to have the jurors convict me on all this other stuff that they're going to use. Mm -hmm. So I go to Don and I said, okay, you know how the government does, right? They usually let you cop out to one count, uh, 17 count indictment, and I'll take the five year rap. And I say, because they ain't going to give me the other way. I said, if they convict me on all 17 counts, they're going to probably give me 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Now, it's something that the government was going to use, which was really stupid that I didn't know. When I was in Lewisburg, it showed my number 33190 bank robbery, 15 years. When I went to Atlanta, I got an Atlanta number, 90441, 15 years. Now that's 30 years. When I went to Marion, it's uh, 1794, another 15. So the government's trying to say that I got 15 here for bank robbery, 15 here for bank robbery, 15 here. Then I had 45 years for bank robbery and got out in four years. And the government, and then the escapes, of course, were dismissed, you know, from a long time ago. So the government was trying to put everything in the world on the cases against me, right? And at that time now, here's something that we don't know at that time. There was a building burnt that I didn't burn with two guys in it that died and burned. And the houses were owned by the lanes, but I didn't burn them. And so what happens is I try to, I told my lawyer, ask for a recess and go to U.S. attorneys and see if they'll take one count. Because that means the maximum sentence I get five years, right? On a plea bargain agreement. And I'll turn in the Cougaran. So they come back and said, no, we will take a two count indictment. I mean, two, give me two counts. So I know the maximum exposure is 10 years. So then I go back and say, okay, here's the deal. On one condition, what? I want complete, because I know I see these names. These are arsons I did, fires I did for people. I want complete immunity for prosecution for any arsons. And I'll, and I'll turn in all the Cougarans and the Switz bars on a two count federal indictment, maximum exposure is 10 years. So that's how we ended up getting the plea bargain agreement. Mm -hmm. Then the plea bargain agreement would only be held as I had to take a lie detector test. Right. That nobody that I killed, that I did not kill or bodily harm anybody. Right. So I agreed to that. So me and Ron Jennings fly down the next day to Dallas, Texas, and we go in there and a guy named Bill Teagan with the FBI was the one that gave me the lie detector test. We become good friends. So me and Ron, we drink that night in a hotel. They're paying everything, my airfare and everything. And me and Ron talked about all the different people in Amarillo and this and that. And so, you know, I haven't made no agreement to turn evidence on a lot of people yet, but I'm finding out different things from Ron because he was a he worked on the Colin Davis murder case. So, and he originally was the ASAC in Fort Worth. He was the ASAC in Emerald. So then what happens is I take the lie detector test and I pass, of course, because I didn't kill nobody. I didn't set no fires when anybody died. That's when we go into the United States Attorney's Office in Campbell and we're sitting there, Shirley LaBelle, uh, McRoberts out of Lubbock, AT and AT and Day of Charlie Baylor, and then also, uh, the task force, the federal task force that had been after me. We're all sitting around this table. And the first thing we get there, he said, you know who I am? And I said, no, he said, I'm Charlie Baylor with at and And he slides his bullet across the table. <laughs> Surely like that, a heart attack. 
I look at a bullet and I say, oh, you got my name on it, huh? Yeah, you son of a bitch, I was going to kill you here. And then he throws these papers and it shows these dead bodies. I said, whoa, pal, I don't care if you're going to shoot me, but I got nothing to do with that. And Shirley Wright has said uh, he passed the lie detector test and they was brought up indirectly about them. He did not commit them crimes. He said, do you know so-and-so? I said, of course I know so-and-so. Why? I said, I got immunity. Of course I can talk about it. And he said, did you ever set that fire on such and such a street? I said, hell no. I don't set no fires where people live in buildings. You ought to know that by now. And that's when they realized, you know, that wasn't my arson. That was somebody else's because I don't set the building when people lived in it. And right. these guys are vagrants anyways. Right. You know, they're living in the building. While so you were talking, I'm going through this gigantic file of paperwork that um, I have uh, collected on you over the years. And so I get a lot of people that cry, say that this is not true or, you know, that uh, these stories are inflated or, you know, I get a lot of people comment these. And so I said, okay, well, you need to go back through the mountains of of newspaper articles and things that I have to verify the story. Um, and I found, I have it all broken down into sections. I've got, you know, the Cougarand scandal and then right next to it, I've got the arsons because it was, they both, you know, all blew up at the same time and, and was in the newspapers at the same time. And during this, I found a, um, a set of pictures of you Dave Merchant and Ringo. What was his name? Was it Robert Ringo? Yeah, Robert Ringo. Because um, it was it was during the arson, and so I'm going to show the viewers. If you can see, right. there you are. Can you see it? Yeah, there you are. There you are. No fedora, but there you are. <laughs> many many years ago, yep, my beard's yep. a kind of different color now. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yeah, and yeah, lots more of it. So, yes. but anyways, I found that, but um, while flipping through this, um, you know, just for those people that uh, don't believe this story or cry that this is a load of crap, right. um, this is all newspaper articles, and I have about this many more stored on my computer that I didn't print out. So, those that want to keep saying that this isn't true, you need to go back, but what I find interesting um, I didn't have these exactly in order. Um, I just have them, you know, bulked into sections. And right next to them is a um, a set that you didn't even know about until many, many decades later. I showed you um, one day. Maybe this will be, you know, because each week we try to introduce what our topic will be next week. This uh, make maybe be what we can talk about next week. You did not realize until decades later. You at 17 years old had shoot to kill orders on your head. You, can oh, yeah, you guys read this? Yeah, yeah, shoot, to, shoot kill. to kill orders right there. Shoot to right. kill orders. Um, and this was one of those things that uh, his uh, wife because uh, she was there with you when I showed you and she's like oh my gosh I have you know and you're like I, I didn't no know idea. either um, you know so this every week we talk about different topics well next week we will talk about um, maybe your escape from Wheaton County Jail right. this is actually where the book starts we don't start at you know in on this day he was born and then right. he did this we start in the middle the book starts in the middle of where you're breaking out of county jail 17 what? years old. Um, yeah. And so um, you were the first person uh, uh, put in that jail and the first person to escape from that jail. And so it was a brand new jail. But uh, so next week, why don't we talk about sure. that escape and your life on the run and everything. And we can talk about these shoot to kill orders. Um, right. In the meantime, I will try to see if I can get through some of these newspaper articles and see if I can find some more um, photographs for you guys to look at but um, there are all sorts of things in here that um, you know we you can't just fit everything in one book so uh, we're just going to be here every week to talk about different topics and uh, right. we will uh, we'll just keep well, making like videos as about, long as we can when I realized you know you know all my life you know even though after I plea bargain out on the Cougaran I mean on the Cougaran deal and all that you know I still got into nothing, do nothing illegal except for the drug deal. 
-hmm. And it's something I'd like to have people understand something. I don't care who you are. Even, even I have worked with federal agents, not FBI now, I'm just going to say other, that actually did cocaine. There's no way in the world you can work undercover and not do drugs. It's impossible. There's no way. And I think nowadays they finally have come to that conclusion. When I went to work for the DEA, you know, and that, you know, I didn't go with the goal of actually, I wanted that $25,000 they were going to give me. And when I originally came back to Texas from Missouri there, that's what I was after. I wasn't after to be back to drugs. Once you start doing drugs, you're dead meat. I mean, I know that. Uh, I carry that little chip in my pocket that I got here when I came in October of 07, which is going to be 13 years now. And I carry that chip and have had no drugs since then. All right. Well, we will see you next week. All right, then. You have a blessed week. May the Lord too. bless you.